Uh, up until now, Paul has been contrasting the use made of their heart and body, these Colossians, with the use they made of their heart and body before they were converted. So it's all about the members of your body, it's all about the way your heart gets into your actions. How you flesh your thoughts then, if you like. And today he is looking at not just the way you use the parts of your body, he's looking at the way you're thinking and the way the things in your heart spill out into your speech and the way you relate to other people. Now, of course, one of the ways biblically that we know what is actually in your heart towards God, the way you use the parts, is the way you use the parts of your body because what goes on in your heart tends to flow over into the things that you do in the body. But the other way, again, biblically, we'll tell what's in the heart is the way your heart overflows into your mouth. Jesus says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And that's what he's dealing with. And he's contrasting the situation before you were a Christian with the situation you've got now, where your old self is like and you put on a new self. And so on. Here it is. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived. But now, you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you've taken off your old self. We're back in that contrast again. You've taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. And if you notice from the bits that are highlighted in red, that Paul is uh, concerned to compare and contrast for these Colossian Christians the difference that conversion has made to them. Conversion is not a very popular word in the current context. Very important biblical word. They make a great deal of conversion. That is, there was a way we once lived, and there's a different way that we now live because we've become Christians. There's been that change of direction. And that's what we mean by conversion. There's been that change of direction of life. Paul isn't appealing to these people then to make a fresh effort. Did you notice that? He's not saying, try harder, boys when it comes to lying and slander and all those things. He's not appealing for a fresh effort, he's appealing to them to live without the old selfish self they've already put off at conversion, and live with the new self they've become at their conversion. Now, what sort of new self? The new self, by definition, is being renewed in knowledge and the image of its creator. The new self is being renewed in knowledge with its creator. So there are three things to notice here. Firstly, this new self is in the process of being renewed. So your new person that you are in Christ is actually one that is by definition in process of being renewed all the time. That's interesting. And secondly, this new self is being renewed in knowledge. What is the importance of getting good Christian teaching? It's the way that our new self is being renewed. So we don't waste away and we'll fall by the wayside in some way, where the parable of the soils talks about. What is the importance of getting and applying yourself to good biblical teaching? Because this is the means by which your new self is renewed. The third thing, so first thing, this new self is in the process of being renewed. Second thing, it's being renewed in knowledge. Third thing, this self is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. That is, in the image of Christ, who is, as described back in chapter 1, himself, the very image of God. Now, sanctification for the Christian, then, is not primarily a matter of fresh human effort. But of continuing to lay aside the old cocoon out of which we've grown and knew somebody has come. And cooperating with the process of renewal that God is doing within our new self. The nature of which new self is to be renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Now, if I go ill now, right, I told you this about it. <laughs> so, I can be ill now. <laughs> but you see the point? That's the whole message, that's the point of this. There are these three things going on in a Christian. Firstly, he's got a new self, which is the process of being, I said he, and, you know, to be honest, um, you could have gender stereotyping, you could have anything today, because I'm really not with it, okay? So if I, if I don't use gender inclusive language, just forgive me today, I'm going to try. The person who has become a Christian, right, is in process of being renewed. 
That new self is being renewed in knowledge, which is the importance of getting and playing good Christian teaching. And this self is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. That's what it gets to look like. Sanctification is not primarily fresh human effort, but is laying aside the old people and growing in that new self as we learn knowledge. Growing in the image of the creator. That's great. But it's not me a theoretical position. I've just laid out for you the, Christ, the biblical Christian approach to sanctification, how we become more like God. Right? But it's not a theoretical position. The, the, the nuts and the bolts in terms of your heart and your mouth as to how the real stuff works out. Here's what changes. You must rid yourselves of all such things as these. See, there's no, you know, this is the doctrine of sanctification. No, it's actually, you guys should not be doing this if this is happening in you. It's nuts and bolts. You must rid yourself of all such things as these anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. How are you going to do it? Is applying yourself to the gaining of Christian knowledge, laying aside the old man, putting on the, and the new man is being renewed in knowledge, in the image of its creator. And the creator has got none of this uncontrolled anger, none of this rage, none of this malice, none of this slander, none of this filthy language. So it comes off your lips. Does that make sense? There are five things, again, to be cast off in this list, as there was in the list last time. This is verse 8 following. The last list was in verse 5 following. Anger and rage. Anger, wrath, bogey, wrath, and thamos. Anger. They go together. And although Stoic philosophers tend to distinguish between the two, saying one is a more or less settled feeling of hatred, the other is more a tumultuous outburst of passion, you can't really put a fact paper between them. They're about the same, in terms of the first century Greek, okay? That's the way they are. It's the same sort of thing. He's just saying, like, you know, he's making the point. Orge and Thomas, you don't want, you don't want any of that. Put them away, and they will be put away by that himself that is being renewed in knowledge and the image of its creator. Because these things belong to the old self that has been cast off and displaced. Anger and rage. Now we're all perfectly willing to sign up to that first list, aren't we? You know, sexual immorality and yeah, was it? all that stuff in that list. Yes. <laughs> But here's, a, here's another list, and there's, there's no distinction of, of seriousness. Uncontrolled anger, rage, malice and slander, kakia and blasphemia. Now, malice, such a general term, it ranges from meaning you know, trouble to a definitely culpable attitude of wickedness. <laughs> Simon Magus, Act 8, 22, offered money to be told how to do miracles well, properly, you know, so you could sell the gift of doing miracles. Uh, from that sort of thing, right through to malice and hatred, the des deliberate desire to do harm, malice. There's a lot of that out there. That can be very fun, though, can't it? And this is a lot, right? The desire to do harm. It's nasty people about it. Blasphemia. Now we think we know what that word means because it sounds like the English word for blasphemy, doesn't it? It, it can mean that. But actually, it's, it's just kind of speaking ill people, speaking against people. Of course, it means speaking against God. But in this in this list of ethical issues here, that, that's about how they relate to one another, defamation of human character is what we're talking about. Running people down in ways that we shouldn't. Any type of vilifying of a person. By lies by gossip. Christians command the slander no one, Titus 3 2. It's very easy to do, isn't it? What else comes off? Filthy language. Ice chronologia. Speaking filthiness. Really? Literally. Ice cross is, 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 is uh, dirt, and language is, well, you've got it. It's a word that only occurs here in the Bible, it's a bit of a shame, uh, because we could have a better handle on it if we had more context in which to work out what it's saying. But outside the Bible, the word covers the ideas of obscenity of speech or abusiveness of language, both things. Language is just, you know. Why does that happen? With somebody yesterday, I can't think where. And you just thought, that, you know, that language is, I'm not perhaps as upset by it as I should be, but what's the point of that? Why is that happening? 
Why are you using those terms? Why are you saying these things? Why does it happen? It happens because people are either out of control, of course, or looking for acceptance, or, or kudos, or, or to be one of the boys, accepted because of rebel. Is that how these things happen? And they're all things completely inconsistent with finding your acceptance and your security in the love of God through Christ. Paul's saying such language should be stopped before it comes out of your mouth. If we believe we're also in Christ. It has no place. And then, again, at the end of this list, an especially emphasised aside that breaks the pattern. There was the five, and then there's this bush. You know, there's three sets of five things. There's five following, there's eight following, there's twelve following, as we'll see again. But then there's this sort of disruption of the pattern. And when Paul uses disruption of the pattern, that's something he wants to emphasise. So here's the disruption of the pattern. He says, don't lie to one another. Don't lie to one another. <coughs> there was something abusing about this on Facebook yesterday. Well, I thought it was. Some Christian man or other on Facebook would best remain nameless. It posted, and when you post your name comes up, so his name came up, such and such a person has just discovered that honesty is not always the best policy in married life. When your wife looks deep in your eyes and says, what do you want to do today, darling? Apparently, get myself a Sky Sports subscription and set into a day of World 2020 Ryder Cup Mayhem and Saturday afternoon football is not a legitimate answer. <laughs> I don't know how long he's been married, but he hasn't been living fast, has he? <laughs> now you can say that's truthful, but it's a little bit insensitive, yeah? It's a little bit insensitive. We can all do that a little bit insensitive, that's the trouble. Where are the boundaries to be? Is there such a thing as a white lie? A little white lie. Our tender age children are taught that there is by their teachers in school, but you won't find that idea in the Bible, will you? Yeah. Here's what Paul writes. Here's the prohibition, verse 9, Colossians 3, verse 9, do not lie to each other. Reason? Since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. What you are not to do is this, to lie. Make through their state, it's do not represent falsehood to one another. Pseudomai is, is to tell the truth, it's simple. And the new man is not going to do it. Who are you not to do it to? To one another. Why do you reckon Paul is telling them this? It's got to be this was a particular problem for the people in Colossae. Why is he breaking the pattern? Why is he making the big emphasis? Because the Christians are lying to one another. <gasps> it's shocking. Fancy that. Isn't it awful? To misrepresent the truth to other people in the same church as you. What do you think? They didn't live truthfully before their brethren in the church. But before we get off on one about that, just stop and ponder on the amount of pretending for respectability's sake that goes on in the churches today. Think of the lies that are told of me to maintain a good impression with the people around. Do not tell or live lies to one another. Why such an emphasis on lying, do you think? Perhaps it's because lying is far more serious than we think it is. And because we've had that big list of sexual sin, we think of that as particularly deviant and so on, a terrible crime against the holiness of God, and it is. But that God who is holy in that sort of way is also the God of all truth, the God who cannot lie, says Titus 1-2, which speaks about the hope of eternal life, which God who does not lie promised before the beginning of time. Let's think about it. It's absolutely right that God should be so against it. Not only because it's a violation of his own truth, his own holiness, the social effects of untrustworthy promises and pledges are enormous. We don't think like that. Have you heard of the banking crisis? Where did that come from? Have you heard of the rigging of the LIBOR rate? Sure you have. People telling ponies. 
you know, the banks are supposed to say what they're having to pay to borrow. That's supposed to be an overall assessment of the health of the, of the financial system. If they report a low number, that could be to their advantage. If they report a higher interest rate number, that could be to their advantage in different circumstances. So what? Who cares? It's all finance, isn't it? Yeah, I know. Because mortgages and student loans and financial derivatives and other financial products and people's pensions are relying on the LIBOR rate being true, being right, and manipulating all that can have a, negative, a serious negative effect on consumers and financial <coughs> markets around the world. And it's caused oceans of personal pain and distress because of lying at work. <coughs> and what about lying to your spouse? How damaging is that? That lad needs a, that lad needs a message on Facebook. <laughs> lying to your spouse? How serious can that be? And what about lying to your boss? Untruths can be a terribly harmful thing. And rebellion against the character of the creator that just runs and unravels and escalates, and before you know it, you're trapped in a way. There is no such thing as a little white light. And Paul has emphasized that. But that's not the rationale for avoiding it. The fact that it's serious is not the rationale for avoiding it. The rationale he's got for avoiding it is kind of different. You must rid yourselves of all such things as these since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. The twofold reason for the Christian's abandonment of these evil ways that are being described is being given. You put off the old man with his practices, verse 9, and you have put on the new man, verse 10. I've said man and I mean self, and you know that. So in this letter, Paul is particularly grounding his exhortations in what has already happened to these Christians. What is true of you as a Christian drives what you're going to be. Often refers them back to their life-changing encounter with Christ. Anybody hear the service on Radio 4 this morning? A bit. A bit funky, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, I heard the first bit, but I didn't turn it off for any reason other than I had to do something else. I could feed some animals. But... Uh, there was a guy there, and it doesn't happen often on Radio 4's worship on a Sunday worship on a Sunday morning. There was a guy standing up talking about what God had done for him. He changed his life. Did you hear that? He got no, it. I didn't hear. Did you hear that? It's got a And he's standing up saying, "This is what's happened. God has changed my life in this." Mm -hmm. Now, you know, Paul wants to take us back there quite often, quite often, to the point where we are turned around and say, "Look, this is, we've been turned around." That old self has been stripped off, as it were, as if, as if you're, you're chucking your kit off to get in the waters of baptism, you know? And then, what they used to do in the early church, you came up out of the waters of baptism and walked up to the other side and they put a white robe over you. He's referring them back there to stripping off the old man when you're baptised in Christ and putting on the new man you've become and we're becoming in Christ. And the imagery Paul is using is, is like, oh, like that baptism in an imagery or... Or if you like, you're dropping your dirty boiler suit by the washing machine when you come in through the back door. <coughs> it's not quite good if Paul had been a, you know, Welsh hill farmer, he'd, he'd, he'd almost certainly use that thing. You know, you come in through the door covered in, you know, all this, and as you come through the door, you peel your kit off and you shove it by the washing machine. Or, you know, if you're well trained, you pick it up and you put it in the washing machine, <laughs> add detergent and set it off. Yeah? That picture of putting on and putting off a garment widespread in the ancient world, and I think Paul is actually plundering the Egyptians here, as it were. What he's doing is he's taking something that's very well known in the Greek mystery religions that afflicted the church in Colossae. Because in them, uh, they had this putting on and putting off of a garment as the initiation, act of initiation into the Greek mystery religion, into the cult. And I think he just picked up that piece of imagery, really. Putting on the garment consecrated the initiate so that he or she was filled with the powers of the cosmos and shared in the divine life and all that in proto Gnosticism, right? In the mystery religions, all that stuff. He's saying, hang on, you put off all that stuff and you put on Christ. Put off your old self, oh, maybe that's what you should know. Uh, you, you've put off your old self and you put on in yourself. Put off the old man, put on 
It's this knowledge of the truth that renovates not the old nature, that renovates the new nature day by day. And the new nature needs renovation day by day because the new nature gets battered and bruised. The new nature takes some wear in this fallen world. It takes a hammering. The people you're amongst, the things you have to deal with, the pains, the trials, the difficulties, and sometimes the joys. Wear down that new character. And that new character needs to be put on again. Not just that, the appeal of the overalls by the uh, washing machine door is immense. Some of us have, or have had at certain times in our lives, a pile of work clothes at the bottom of the wardrobe. We love to be in them because they're kind of comfy, we know them. And sometimes you see a guy who's got a wife who gives him a terrible chip for the sake of his jacket or the sake of his work trousers. He's comfortable in them, he's working. And the temptation to go back to that old pile of kit and pick it up and sneak it on again is immense. And Paul's saying, look, you know, you've done it. Put it off. And put on the new man. Who is being renewed day by day in the image of the Creator? Okay, so there's the rationale for all of it. <coughs> and there's the process. Verse 11 moves on to talk about levelling the ground, which is a great excuse for having a nice fog with a bulldozer on the screen. <laughs> Look at that, that's smart. It's a new Holland, but you can't have everything. In order to take away the false confidence that keeps some of these Colossians from relying on this God appointed means for their sanctification, that's the trouble. You know, we, we, we can lose our confidence that this is going to work. But giving ourselves to learning God from the Bible, putting off the old man, putting on the new man, day by day. We can lose our confidence, it's going to work. What we do is we go back to the old rules approach. And we start beating ourselves with the stick again. See what I mean? Because we lose confidence that this is going to work. Or we go back to our old reasons for pride. And we pick those up again. I'm from a better sort of family. I'm from a church family. I'm from a... In order to take away the false confidence that keeps some of these Colossians in from relying on this God-appointed means for the sanctification, Paul turns to those who are pretending to be superior in all sorts of ways, either because of their Greek culture or because of their Jewish heritage, and he levels the ground at the foot of the cross. Now bear in mind the sexual sins in, in the earlier list are the sort of things the Jews particularly accuse the Gentiles of. But the anger, the intemperate speech and so on, were the things that cultured Greeks, influenced by Stoicism, accused uncultured barbarians of. So they've both got their sort of abuse lists, but they heard one another mentioned here. And Paul has proved in the first three chapters of Romans that none of this stuff was of any use to anybody. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are, all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption of the King by Christ Jesus. It's none of those old distinctions that are worth ending to you. There's no distinction between people wherever they consider their superiority lies. In terms of salvation, see Romans, and here significantly in terms of sanctification in Colossians 3 verse 11. There is absolutely no human distinction to be drawn. Paul will admit of no human distinction of origin, religious privilege, culture, social class, no privilege is accepted where salvation and the means of sanctification are concerned. Sometimes we are very happy with that for salvation, but when it comes to sanctification, well, I'm, I'm, I'm better than that. I was raised better than that, or I've got a better heritage than that. You see how it goes. Paul is having none of that. How extreme a view is Paul taking on this matter? No Jew or Gentile. Bosh. There are the two main classifications of people in the ancient world demolished to the ground. In about three or four words. Now to rub out that distinction is absolutely radical. That would, that would have many audiences in his day shouting, screaming, hurling abuse and possibly more. Rocks. 
in a polarised world that Paul has come from. No. It's a gospel issue. Bosh. Not messing about. There is no difference between people where these issues are concerned according to their ethnicity, origin or breeding. Being the child of the right or of the wrong parents is irrelevant to the issue. Apparently that's not what the heretics are saying. And no ritual observance made any difference either. No active initiation. No cultural or religious rigmarole. Neither circumcised nor uncircumcised. Barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. Cultural difference. No benefit at all in conveying any form of moral superiority to Paul. Uh, what's a barbarian? Any guys who play Newport on it? What's it, I mean? <laughs> what are barbarians? The word started out life, uh, uh, life meaning those who say ba 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 ba, meaning those who talk gibberish. Because the Greeks looked at them and said they can't speak Greek. What's that funny language they're speaking? Welsh or something? What's going on? Pictish or whatever. What is that? They talk gibberish. And the barbarians were those who spoke in such a way. So they were people who didn't speak Greek, and that's the way it went on. Not one of us. Just as the Jews divided humanity into two groups, they're Jew and Gentile, we've seen that. So the Greeks also divided humanity into two groups. Greek and barbarian. Where did the Scythian come in? Yeah, you wanted to know that, didn't you? They represent the lowest of the barbarians. They seem to have come from the area around the Black Sea. And their lot as slaves was a particularly wretched Lot. They were a particularly wretched slave class at the bottom of the pile. None of that, says Paul. You could be a Scythian pastor in a church with patrician congregation, as far as God is concerned. In that context, that would have been, in a very hierarchical society, that would have been outrageous. Likewise, in the kingdom of God, and in view of the new humanity, social position is also irrelevant. It doesn't matter whether you're a slave, it doesn't matter whether you're free. Now, look, bear in mind, in the ancient world of Paul and of Plato, Plato saw the slave as, he called it, a living tool. And an implement was a dead tool. Hammer. Yeah. In those days, and against that background, in the kingdom of God, Paul is saying, slaves and free men are brothers for whom Christ has died. Leveling the ground at the foot of the cross. So then, there's the word we're looking for. Conclusion. And we're concluding a bit of a section here as well, uh, as we come to the end of verse 11. There's a fresh list that begins in, in, in verse 12. <coughs> Paul's main appeal in chapter 3 of Colossians, his previous appeal, is to aim at the things of God. Live for the things of God. And that's the main aim of the Christian life. Right? If you want to go out and live a Christian life, you want to know how to do it, here's how we do it. We aim for above. Aim at the things of God. And these things are theirs because of their union with Christ in his death and resurrection. He's been establishing that in the earlier verses, verses 1 to 4. And their reality, in their own experience, then gets expressed in accordance with the appeals that follow on. Put to death, verse 5, and a list of things. Put away, verse 8, and a list of things. And then we'll see, put on, verse 12, and a list of good things. It's getting better. And the first of these appeals to put to death recalls their union with Christ in his death. It's because they've died with him, they have put to death whatever belongs to their old earthly nature, the way you express that nature through your bodily acts. Two lists, is that list? Bodily expression of sins through the members of the body, all those things in the list starting sexual immorality. And then there's the list of things to do with the heart spilling out, not through the body parts, but through the mouth. The list we've been looking at today, verse 8 following. And it's all set in a once now. Once you're like this, now you're like this format. To highlight the decisiveness of conversion and its ongoing effects. The list of things Paul mentions. These things should, should lie like. Uh, Crumpled like a, a discarded bowler suit by the washing machine door. Not get resuscitated in an attempt to bring them back to life and hope the wife doesn't notice, you know? These people, as Christians, you Colossians, you will have put off the old man with its practices, verse 9. 
You will put on the new man, which goes on being renewed in this life, in the image of its creator, as its faith, as its renewed in knowledge, in the image of its creator, as the soul is fair. Finally, please note, within this realm of the new people in Christ, there's no class, there's no culture, there's no racial or gender inferiority. Because men and women of utterly diverse origins are found in the kingdom of God, sharing a common basis of faith and justification, and expressing in the same way their allegiance to the one Saviour and Lord, regardless of race and class and background. And in the week, we're again with them about little kids getting beaten up in school because they're English. It strikes me this is such a relevant passage for Sunday. Though. It needs to be different in the Church of God. Amen?